in the Buddha's analysis of suffering, the causes leading to suffering, there are three things that follow immediately on ignorance. Bodily fabrication, the way you breathe. Verbal fabrication, the way you talk to yourself. And mental fabrication, the feelings you focus on and the perceptions you hold in mind, the images that you give to yourself of the world and of yourself. And as long as we do these things in ignorance, they're going to cause suffering. If we bring some knowledge to them, they can form the path. But we have to do it consistently, otherwise the path begins to develop and then we cut it off. It's like planting a seed. Say you plant a seed for a large tree, and when a tiny shoot comes up, you say, this is not the tree I want, and so you cut it. And if it's a strong seed, it may send up another shoot, but you cut it again. After a while, it will begin to run out of strength. So you have to learn how to protect the path. That is formed when you do these things in knowledge and awareness. Because especially those two latter fabrications, the way you talk to yourself and the way you picture things to yourself, those are going to determine your actions. And if you can learn how to have a consistently right view, which is what verbal fabrication and perceptions can create with knowledge, then your actions will all be consistent with the path, and the path will have a chance to grow. So you have to look into the way you talk to yourself. When a conversation in your mind begins to veer off in the wrong direction, can you bring it back to the right direction? You've got to learn how to internalize the teacher. and learn how to side with that inner teacher, rather than rebelling against it. So the teacher will talk to you in a certain way and will recommend certain perceptions. And you've got to find where in your mind the other voices are that want to hold on to other perceptions that would pull you away, saying the path is too difficult, or say taking the precepts demands too much out of me. Or concentration demands too much. You've got to learn how to change those voices, change those perceptions, and do it willingly. This is why when the Buddha analyzes the way the path develops, there's one analysis where he says that there are three factors that circle around all the other factors. There's right view, right mindfulness, right effort. Right view is basically a series of perceptions that let you see that the path is the best path there is. That the question of how to put an end to suffering is the big question in life, and the path is the answer. And all the details that follow from that. Right mindfulness is what keeps that in mind. And this can be the governor of your practice in the same way that a machine has a governor. In other words, the part of the machine that makes sure that it doesn't run too slow, it doesn't run too fast, that it runs just right and runs consistently. And the Buddha defines this as the duty of mindfulness, that when you see that there's a skillful quality in the mind that could be developed and it's not there, you remember that it should be developed. And if it's there, you remember that it should be protected. You've got to keep this in mind. And keep reminding yourself again and again, so you don't go slipping off and siding with the, the side of ignorance. You want to keep pulling yourself back to the side of knowledge. And this is why you need right effort. If you just have the views and just have the mindfulness, they don't go anywhere without the effort. And the effort is not just brute force. An important part of the effort is generating desire.
talking to yourself in a way in which you want to stick with the practice, and you want to develop, and you want to protect what you've got. Because as the Buddha said, all things are rooted in desire, and this applies very much to the path. It's not going to happen unless you generate the desire for it, and you do it consistently. Otherwise, the little shoot comes out and you just cut it off. You say, this isn't the big tree I want. I want a big tree right away. That's not going to happen. You have to learn to remind yourself, where do big trees come from? Well, they come from little shoots, little shoots that are protected, especially when they're weak. They need water, they need sun. They need shelter from extremes. In other words, you've got to use some restraint. When certain ideas come into the mind or listen to people's, other people's ideas, you have to figure out which ones you have to filter out. There's that teaching from psychologists that you have to be open to all things. It's really Not very wise, because there's a lot of wrong view out there. There's certain issues on which, obviously, you can't say for sure that you know. You can't know for sure that the path is true until you followed it. You can't know for sure that you really do have choices in your actions. And after all, everything could be just a huge illusion. But you also know that if you allow for those views to sneak in, they destroy any desire to follow the path. As the Buddha points out, it's wisest to take a bet on the views that would give power to your actions. And expand the range of what you think can be done by action. Of course, that's going to require more of you, because the actions that lead to the end of suffering are more than just ordinary, everyday punching in the clock, putting in time, going home. It's a more constant effort that's required. More mindfulness is required. But you learn how to motivate yourself. You realize if you just punch in the clock and do what society tells you, what can they promise to you? Not much. They don't expect much out of you. And do you want to limit your expectations for yourself to what the society outside expects out of you? They just see you as a potential consumer, maybe a worker. Although nowadays it's getting strange they don't want workers, but they want consumers. And when you can no longer consume and no longer work, they're done with you. They throw you away. Whereas right view doesn't throw you away, unless you throw it away. You've got to hold to it consistently. And that means as it runs up against contrary perceptions that you've picked up from who knows where. You've got to generate the desire to side with right view against those old perceptions. It's only then that the path can pick up momentum. Otherwise, you've got to stick with these things And John Lee has an analysis of the path. He says there's the right path and the wrong path. And the worldly path, he says, tries to straddle both. And of course it goes nowhere. Because one path leads in one direction, the other path leads in the opposite direction. And when you straddle these things, you just get caught. Can't move in any, any real direction. It's only when you make up your mind you've got to stick with the path and see it through. Only then can it show its results. Only then can the little seed turn into a tree. So you've got to remind yourself how much you want that tree. Keep reminding yourself how much you want that tree. 
and learn not to scoff at little sprouts as they come up. See them as potentials. And learn to perceive the path as something you enjoy doing and not as a onerous task. Because what is the Buddha asking you to do? He's asking you to be virtuous. You have the pride and self-esteem that can come with virtue. When people try to tempt you with their money or their rewards or their whatever, their recognition, to do something against the precepts. And you can say, no, that means you've got a precept that's worth more than whatever amount of money that was, worth more than whatever recognition there was. And there may be people who say, well, you can't eat that, that pride, but it's sustenance for the mind. You've got to learn how to appreciate that sustenance, because otherwise the mind is left hungry as the body gets to feed. You keep feeding the body and feeding it and feeding it, and finally it dies on you anyhow. Whereas the mind doesn't die, but it's going to survive thin and weak. That's not a good kind of survival. The wise investor always invests in the things that are going to last for a long time. And the investment here has to be continual. Stick with it, stick with it. You practice the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma and not in accordance with your mood, or in accordance with convenience. There are times when it's going to require some sacrifices. So learn to see the sacrifices as noble, and it's something you enjoy doing, you enjoy gaining in nobility. Because when the Buddha talks about generating desire, it's not grudgingly. You want to learn how to talk to yourself in such a way that you really enjoy sitting and meditating, that you enjoy holding to the precepts, you enjoy trying to figure things out, develop your ingenuity so you can get the rewards of discernment. When you can perceive the path as something enjoyable, that makes it a lot easier for you and the people around you. So remember these three things that have to circle around the path to keep it going. Right view, right mindfulness, mindfulness as a governing principle, and right effort in generating desire to follow through with your right views. That way you can continually bring knowledge and skill to the way you talk to yourself, to the way you picture things to yourself. That word vijja in Pali, the opposite of avijja or ignorance, means both knowledge and skill. Just as avijja, ignorance, can also mean lack of skill. We're working on a skill here. It's like learning how to play the piano. The first time you touch the keys, it may sound kind of awkward. I don't see anything beautiful coming out of this. But if you put in the time and put in your powers of observation and learn how to talk to yourself, generate desire to keep at, keep at it, keep at it, keep at it, the results are sure to come. 